So, welcome everyone to our virtual event space. My name is Allie, and I will be the host for this evening. Um, I'm so excited to be introducing Benjamin Percy and Julia Whalen here to discuss Benjamin's brand new novel, The Ninth Metal. So before we get into the fun stuff, I just want to quickly thank you all so very much for tuning in and for buying books. Uh, for those of you who may not know, we are an independent bookstores with three locations in the Seattle area, and your support really is what keeps us going. Uh, and we really love what we do. So if you also love what we do, we would so appreciate appreciate it if you swing by and grab copies or if you're not local we do ship shipping is 350 for the first book and a dollar for every book after that and i will be linking in uh, books in the chat all evening so they will be easy to find uh, while you are over on our website i definitely recommend checking out some of our other upcoming events or sign up for our newsletter it is a weekly update about events exciting releases, our online book clubs, and of course you can follow us on any of the major social media platforms. We are at Third Place Books for the quickest updates and recommendations. So we are here for about an hour and towards the end we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, which we very much hope that you do, go ahead and leave those in the Q&A box, which should be either at the top or at the bottom of your screen, depending on your device. It is different than the chat box, uh, which is great for for virtual applause and connecting with each other. But when it comes time for questions, definitely do make sure that those end up in the Q&A so that we can most easily find them. And I believe that that is all of my housekeeping. So without further ado, I am so thrilled to introduce Benjamin Percy, who has won a Whiting Award, a Plimpton Prize, two Pushcart Prizes, and an NEA Fellowship, uh, and the iHeartRadio award for best scripted podcast. His books include The Unfamiliar Garden, The Dark Net, The Deadlands, uh, Red Moon, and The Wilding, three short story collections, an essay collection, Thrill Me, uh, writes Wolverine and X-Force for Marvel Comics, and of course, the novel of the evening, uh, The Ninth Metal, in which a catastrophic meteor shower has caused a modern day gold rush uh, turning the small middle of nowhere town into the center of everything and how one family hopes to control it all. So in conversation tonight, I am so excited to welcome Julia Whalen, an award-winning actor, writer, Grammy-nominated audiobook director and narrator of over 400 audiobooks, including The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, Gone Girl, and Tara Westover's Educated, for which she won the 2019 Best Female Narrator, Audie, and in service for the performance of her own internationally best-selling novel, My Oxford Year. Uh, just this last year, Audiophile Magazine named her one of its golden voices. So thank you both so very much for being here. I am so excited to listen in on this conversation. If you need anything, of course, give me a shout. I will be listening. And with that, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was so nice. <laughs> Hi, Ben. Hello. Thanks Hello, for cheers. taking the time to yes. Thanks for taking the time to bullshit with me. Absolutely, what man. You, what Congratulations. Are you I am drinking some fussy, like distillers edition Lagavulin. Oh wow, that's smoky. Then I've always I don't got mess around. Lagavulin. You know, it tastes like a a wet sheepdog smoking a cigar. <laughs> that's it's what I was going for. Just okay. nailed it. Um, I I don't have to record tomorrow, so <laughs> slancha. <laughs> That bottle's going down in the course of this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, one of the the nice things about Zoom is that I can reach readers and pair up with other writers and cool people who I wouldn't yeah. have been able to otherwise on a traditional book tour. And uh, you and I met a few years back. I can't even, I mean, uh, was it a thousand years ago? Or yeah, something like that. Ago? It I, feels that sure. way, yeah. But we met at the Breadloaf Writers Conference, and uh, for those people who aren't familiar with Breadloaf, it is a gathering of, I don't know, 300 people or so, 300 sure. nerds up in yep. the Breadloaf Mountains of Vermont, and uh, it's every August, and it's like an ancillary satellite campus of Middlebury, um, and, and it's basically all day, every day lectures, readings, workshops, and 
and cocktails. <laughs> so there were there were fair of cocktails. <laughs> uh, and and to some people, right, it's it's um it's literary Shangri La, and to other people, it's totally anxiety inducing. <laughs> yeah. You of yeah. us, you of nerds, and and uh, and and a very evident hierarchy as well that makes people uncomfortable. Yes, yeah, that's that's kind of that's a definitely an earmark of of that conference. Yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to talk about that later with regards to genre, you know. And is and it the, still nicknamed Bedloaf? Yeah, I think it might be. Although that is like a throwback. I'm just seeing a question come in. Um, yeah, I think that was a different era, um, but I everyone is still aware of that nickname. Right, right. I didn't. I didn't witness anything. So, um, yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, while you were there, you were negotiating your first book deal. Am I right about that? Yeah, actually, that is sort of. I. I was because I, I think we met because <laughs> we were both looking for reception in a yeah. field because someone had been like, "You can get some over there." And right. so I walked up, and you were on your phone, and um, we were both trying to such hacks we were both trying to call la <laughs> um but yeah it was the same producer the same we production. were we were we were both on hold for the same production company which just cracked me up in a field and in the middle fighting, of nowhere vermont the, the, the one you know, fighting the, for the signal, bell signal floating around in the um world. and i was like you go ahead yours is more viable but we no we um i, I that was my sort of i had a draft it was going out on sub and um i just needed to like step away from the manuscript for a while. So the timing actually couldn't have been better because to have those 10 days of just craft and lecture and being around other writers and kind of um, reminding myself that it wasn't all imposter syndrome, I could actually do this was uh, was like so right. Perfect, yeah. perfect timing. And ben, I ben. even applied, you know, my I applied to Breadloaf because I saw you were teaching um, because I don't write literary fiction anymore. I went to Middlebury as an undergraduate and, and you know, that was kind of the tradition that I came up in, but I never really thought there was a place for me at Breadloaf. And then I saw that they were letting you teach. <laughs> that guy in. And I was like, wait, maybe they actually, maybe there is, uh, there's room for me. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. That was the weirdo yeah. braided out. They're like, you know. You, you could, are, but you come by it honestly. I mean, you do teach and, you know, you know what you're doing. Yeah, well, I have I have fond memories of, of Breadloaf and Swanee and Tin House and all of those different yeah, writers. I love so Tin I look, House, too. I look forward to the time when we can all come together in literary fellowship again. Oh, yeah, but, man, this is, this is good, but this isn't, yeah. not quite right. But since then, I mean, you have, your, your star has always been rising, but you have just been dominating the audiobook market. And, and I feel really lucky to have join forces with you on the ninth medal so thank you for for reading it and and on that note uh we thought we might do something kind of fun and kind of dorky uh do uh kind of dueling banjos thing awesome so we're gonna read an excerpt from the ninth medal together and and you should know that julia is a professional and i am a hobbyist so. You know what I don't like about this? I don't like the framing of this because everyone will ask, because I asked, why aren't you doing your own book? Because, you know, the voice well, is legendary. The thing and is, so... it would be like, if, if, I, if I narrate something, it's the equivalent of like a, an eight foot guy being in a movie and nobody commenting on his height. You just, all you would be doing is like, what is that eight foot tall guy doing in this right. movie? You know, being... yeah. Uh, is no one going to talk about this? Yeah. Like, why? If I'm reading the audiobook, people are just going to be like, why does this guy sound like a lion? I would like to hear you do Stacy's voice, though, <laughs> or something that would be worth it. Okay. Sorry. Let's go back to. Let's do let's it. Go back to our. Okay. So, yeah, we're going to jump into chapter 10 of the ninth medal. Um, and you're kicking us off. Okay. At some point, you read a bedtime story to your child for the last time. At some point, you run through a sprinkler or hit a home run or stand on your head for the last time. At some point, you go from hating to tolerating to loving to requiring coffee. At some point, you go from grieving a lost parent to remembering him or her fondly. Most transitions are gentle and unrecognized and individual. This one 
was violent and collective. Everyone could point to the same date on the calendar and say, then, that was when everything changed. In northern Minnesota, the night birds went silent. Worms and salamanders twisted out of the dirt. Cats yowled in yards and dogs whimpered under beds. Some people suffered from sudden migraines and others noticed their feelings tanging their mouths with the taste of metal and others shook their cell phones and said, hello, can you hear me? Hello? And then the sky fell. The meteors, some the size of golf balls, hailed down one after the other, a constant fusillade. Some were as big as zeppelins and knuckled up huge mounds of earth spiked with woods. Trees splintered and caught fire as though struck by cannonballs. Silos opened up and spilled their grain in a hissing rush. Lakes splashed and chimneyed with steam. Houses vanished. A woman named Jessica Peterson was driving a semi north along Highway 1, hauling a tank full of milk. She leaned over the steering wheel, craning her neck to take in the sky. The radio fuzzed in and out, country music, Bible, thumping preachers, news reports, a chaotic babble. She spun the dial until it settled on classic rock. The station was running a theme show, a comet countdown. David Bowie's Starman gave away to Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven. A hula girl was anchored to the dash. The paint on her belly was worn away because Jessica liked to rub it for luck. And she rubbed it now. But it was too late for luck. She didn't see the meteor itself, only the crown of the fire-edged asphalt rising before her. A crater had opened the road and she couldn't break fast enough. The semi chunked over the lip of rubble and descended into the sudden pit. The grill struck the far side of it and the semi accordioned with the doom and shriek of rent metal. The tires melted and the milk glugged out of the fissured tank and formed a scalding pond that boiled and steamed. A man named Paul Weitz was washing dishes after dinner while his daughters watched television in the living room. They kept complaining about the quality of the picture and he kept telling them, it's so horrible, shut it off and get your butts to bed. He added more soap to suds up the water and scraped some dried yolk off a plate with his fingernail and then noticed that the half and quarter full glasses on the counter beside him were trembling. Water shivered inside them. Their rims chimed against each other. He looked out the window in time to see the shining paths of a dozen or more meteors. He charged into the living room and scooped up his daughters with his soap splattered hands just as the house began to shake. Holes opened in the ceiling and the floor. Cinders splintered the air. He dodged between columns of short-lived night, and when he glanced up, he could see rough patches of the sky. His daughters were screaming when he laid them in the bathtub and covered their body with his and said, It's going to be okay. Daddy will keep you safe. Ken Pierce was out on Miner's Lake in his V-Sport cruiser. He had a six-pack of hams on ice in the cooler and a pole baited with a leech in the water. Fish probably wouldn't be biting this time of night, but what the hell, here he was waiting on the meteor shower to get going, so he might as well try his luck. When the sky began to streak and strobe, so did the reflective surface of the water, so that he felt he was floating inside a globe of shaken stars. The air trembled with the thunder of sonic booms and cratered moorings, so Ken didn't hear the water splashing and plopping all around him as fish leaped crazed by what was happening. He spilled his beer when a walleye flopped into his lap. One sunfish and then another smacked the deck. A trout arched over the railing and rattled directly into the ice-filled cooler. He didn't need his pole after all. And on a 400-acre lot 30 miles outside of North Fall, a quick succession of impacts pounded the earth. Not much remained of the Gunderson's maple forest but scorched stumps and burning leaves. The displaced dirt had nudged the foundation of the house up on one side so it sat crookedly, but it was otherwise spared. Its windows had shattered. Some of the vinyl siding had melted. Bricks still fell from the chimney. Water gurgled from a broken pipe. 
One meteor hit so close to the house and produced a splash of molten metal like a muddy wave of lava. And the little boy named Hawken was slammed by the final burning reach of it. He barely had time to throw up his arm before it struck him. His scream was silenced before it ever left his mouth. He went rolling across the lawn, cowled in red hot metal. The lawn scorched and smoked beneath him. His clothes and hair were incinerated. He lay there for several minutes, his body tremoring in the metal cooled to a silver sheen that slowly shrank to patches like puddles drying in the sun before being absorbed into his skin entirely. He went still and then rose with a gasp, deep and hungry. He looked around at a landscape that was unrecognizable, all smoke and fire and what looked like some hellish lake, a massive silver vein, a massive silver reach veined through with red. He ran then into the night. He had forgotten about the stranger with the shotgun. He had forgotten about his parents. He had forgotten his name. For the moment, he was nothing but fried nerve endings, and he had no plan except to escape the pain that seemed centered in this place. He would later be discovered wandering naked down the middle of the highway with a blank look on his face. And when asked what happened, he could only say, the sky fell on me. Nice. Cue the thunderous applause. Fun. Um... Thanks. Thanks for doing that. Absolutely. Uh, okay, wait. I somehow have no picture. Hang on. Oh. Oh, no, you were right there. Come back. So, you know, I thought it would be interesting to talk about, talk about acting. I don't, I don't have your background, but I was, you know, in a bunch of crappy high school plays and some okay mm -hmm. college plays. And I even, you know... <laughs> was was in the American Cabaret Theater Company one summer. And I, something about that experience I feel like is essential to me being a writer. I feel as though, I feel as though every writer should have to take a course in the theater. Uh, and, and we've talked a little bit about this before, the way that, you know, there, there's so many things to consider about the mise-en-scene of the, of the stage about about the way in which an actor is possessed by a role, the way in which, you know, you're always considering how you're placed on the stage in relation to the other actors, the way in which you fiddle with a prop, the way in which you're saying something and maybe meaning something else. And, and I, in a way, I mean, all of those techniques, they still inform what I'm doing at the keyboard. I mean, do you feel the same way when you're, you know, when you're hammering away at your own novels? Um, that's a very, very good question. I absolutely do. I come first and foremost from an acting consciousness um, because I think I write uh, character-driven stuff first and foremost. Like it starts with character for me. And so I, I will absolutely, I mean, what you're talking about, like there's two separate parts of this. One is, yes, kind of all eyes on the, various balls, the plate spinning aspect of particularly live theater, of the movement through a scene, the touch points, the, the rhythm kind of musically of what is happening. That's definitely part of it. And I think that the, the other just being aware of a character's motivation throughout any, that is what is driving the story no matter what. And I agree that I think I've never seen a writer like not benefit from an acting class. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, it, I don't know, it, it had, I'm always thinking of character first as well. You know, I, I have this thing where I, I hang on the wall over here. I've got scrolls of paper that are sort of blueprints for stories. And sometimes I'm thinking about a novel two or three years before I actually start to compose it. And the left side of this scroll is all filled with characters. You know, I'll, I'll do a little Wikipedia entry on them. Sometimes I'll draw them. I'll, I'll start to figure out snippets of dialogue that they might utter. You know, you do that work that 
that sometimes the audience never sees. And you're doing the same thing with acting, right? There's always those rehearsals where you're just improvising in that character's voice off script and everything. And it's only later when I actually start to figure out, once I actually know this character is, once I, once I figure out what they want, what their motivation is, then I am able to put obstacles in the way of that desire, like a cruel God, you know, and that's when the yeah. stirrings of plot are. Yes, absolutely. But to do that, I think you have to, you have to know the character first, you know, you have to, you have, that's the basic acting thing. What is the motivation? What do they want? Yeah. And then how and, can you screw with it? Yes. How does this, I'm, I'm really curious about the whole audio book directing and narration experience. Um, you know, how do you immerse yourself in books other than your own try, and try to bring them to light, to life in your own unique way? So, you know, when I came out of, when I came out of Middlebury as an undergrad and I was dead set, I had my novel and stories thesis and I was also, I had an idea for a historical fiction. I was working, 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 trying to write. And I was also doing like pick up screenplay stuff when it would, when it would come to me. And I had I was just starting to pay the bills with audiobooks. And what I found was that I was not good enough at either endeavor to be able to do them simultaneously. So like, I could not stay in my own writing voice if I knew like later that day, I would have to go and be in someone else's voice. I was not secure enough in my own voice to, to do that. Um, and so I, I, I have a, for me, it's just like, it's just been getting better at both things and being able to switch that off. Now, sometimes a book is just too demanding or I've got too many to get through. I, especially drafting, like first draft of a piece. I mean, this is why it's taken me, you know, four years for the next book. Like this is just, it's, it's a lot to be a custodian of someone else's work while trying to gestate your own. It's, mm -hmm. It's, you think that, yeah. you know, is there sort of like a, a guiding voice that you think carries through no matter, you know, no matter what book you're narrating, yeah. do you stay in control as Julia or do you try to bend your voice around the narrative? I, I do to a certain extent, but you don't want to get into a situation where you're like pulling voices or doing something that's out of character. Like people have your interpretation that they expect and I'd never want to mess with that entirely but sometimes a voice is so strong or the narrative calls for something completely different um and you know and then that's just that comes down to just interpretation like that to me is less about the acting training and more about the writer training like really trying to figure out what an author's intention is and how I can help them adapt this for a listening audience and on that note, I mean, before Julie recorded The Ninth Metal, you know, we got on the phone and we talked the book out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, know, you were asking me about different characters. You know, how would you describe this character? Uh, what do you, you know, give me a few adjectives that you think define their voice. Uh, what, if, if there was an actor playing this role, yeah. you know, who would you cast? Uh, and it was really interesting to get that that other perspective well especially in something this i mean i don't know i don't know if people in the room here have actually had a chance to read the book yet probably not but it's a it's a pretty sprawling epic cast of characters and so it's not like you you know people have kind of minimal screen time so you want to come in and like make them as memorable as possible so that when they're they come back a couple of chapters later people are like oh, okay i'm in it so like again this is just the experience of having narrated so many books that i'm always like kind of on the lookout for again how can i help adapt this to a listener um and sometimes it's successful and sometimes it's not but i feel like i've got a good toolkit at this point to try to make it as successful as possible. And the technical elements of it are interesting as well in that you were saying, okay, which of these characters appears in the other books? Right? Yeah, because that's always my first question. Something larger. Um, and, and so, you know, you were planning on hopefully doing The Unfamiliar Garden, the sequel, and, you know, you're like, okay, I'm gonna pin that voice. Yeah. You know, and I had that experience a little bit too. I did the audio book a few years ago for Red Moon. 
and you know the book is massive it's you know i don't know what it is 800 pages maybe and and by the time you know you're on page 500 you don't know what you were doing on page 200 so i'd you know come to like an old lady's voice and i'd be like i don't know doing dick van Dyke. <laughs> what i did right <laughs> They'd be like, no, that sounds wrong. Let's go back. And they thankfully had organized all of these different things. And they were yeah. And I mean, up. you know, for me, especially like when I found out that this was a series, which I didn't know when I, when I, um, I, I took it, but I was like, okay, this, I need to, cause the word, my nightmare is like when I do a series that releases, you know, once one book a year or something over the course of five years, but in that year I've recorded 40 or 50 books and I just have like, no memory of having done this book. And so I do, I rely very, that's my, that's my booth. And in there I've, you know, got my little wizardry. I can keep a list of running characters like a psychopath. So that's, uh, that's, it's, that's essential for sure. For sure. Um, and, you know, we were talking earlier about you know, you were talking about ba the balance in your life, like, okay, here I am, I'm going to audio, do an audio book later in the afternoon, here I am trying to write a novel of my own, the worlds kind of bleed together, one voice intrudes upon the other. It's difficult sometimes to, when you, I don't know what the right word is, diversifying your creative life, your professional life, it yeah. is sometimes hard to create those fences between things, and that's something I'm always thinking about, right? Because I'm writing comics and then I'm writing a podcast and then I'm writing an article and then I'm writing the novel and I'm writing a, for TV or a movie. And you're just like, how do you, you know, I'm just curious about your techniques. My techniques are I try to segment my day as best as I can. And, you know, I'll do like the heavy lifting in the morning and novels are typically the heavy lifting. Um, and then I'll try to maybe edit in the evening or I'll devote a chunk of days, you know, I'll, okay, for three days, all I'm going to do is immerse myself in this one project. But, you know, sometimes, sometimes your brain feels a little bit like it's being torn to confetti, right? It does. And I, I am not, I'm nowhere near your diversification or your juggling right now. Like that is happening on a level. I, I do not, I don't understand how you do what you do. Um, I just am working on one creative project at a time and then I've got the book which you know it's like not just the time in the booth it's also reading the book ahead of time prepping the book talking to the author or producer about the plan of the, the strategy for it obviously all the admin of being like you know self-employed so there's always just like the business of getting through the day which is why I can't I could not be juggling multiple stories or and I think that's just part of like also staying in in books and that's why like even having if I'm writing if I'm drafting I'm not reading books for fun electively I'm doing my work and I'm trying to keep that to a minimum so that again there's just not as much cross-pollination happening so I mean look I think you you do have the the amount that is on your plate is daunting I would just say, I think that at least it's, to your point, diversified in that it's comics, novel, screenplay, essay. Does that help? Like flipping in and out of different- It does help that they're in different mediums uh, in that I can code shift, you know, I change my skill set. If I'm writing for audio, yeah. for instance, and I have a you know new podcast that just launched um, called Old Man Star Lords for Marvel. It's about the Guardians of the Galaxy, you know. If I'm writing, a podcast that that is it totally broke my brain when I first started doing them because let's take a, tr a, a visual medium comics and translate it to audio and it's not just that it's not just the questions like how do you write a fight scene which is right. what the majority of comics are. how do you write a fight scene and not totally confuse people in audio it's also like where are people located what time of day is it you know what are they doing how do you how do you communicate that in a way that's not super clumsy where yeah. you got expository dialogue, you know, there's a lot of like renegotiation of your skill set, uh, a new arsenal of techniques you have to develop. And that's just one example of many where, right, I'm doing something completely different. It's like I'm riding a unicycle instead of driving a truck or something. So, uh, yes, if I'm writing maybe uh, three novels at once, that's a little different, you know. Uh, yeah, that's so, too. So, yeah. 
That's too much. You know, something that occurred to me is we're talking about how performance affects writing. And I think it does have to do with approaching um, whatever it is, whatever given piece it is from a character perspective. One of the things that I loved about the ninth metal was that you start with this kind of, you know, massive event, but did you, in conceiving of this, did you think about, okay, this thing happens and then here's all the myriad human responses to this thing? Yeah, you know, here's what I was thinking. One, I have been writing for Marvel and DC for many years now, since 2014. And as much as I love doing that, as much as it's not to be too corny, but kind of a childhood dream come true, you know, these aren't my characters, this isn't my world. So I wanted to create my own MCU or DCU. I wanted to create a shared universe. And it's not that that tradition is unique to comics. You know, when I say shared universe, I mean that Iron Man, the same, you know, whatever he does that ripples over into Thor, which ripples over into Spider-Man and, you know, there's intersections between it. That's the same thing that's going on in the work of Louise Erdrich and William Faulkner. They've created shared universes. Yeah. Um, and, and so part of it was that. Uh, and I'm taking this age old sci-fi concept, right? Something you've seen over and over again. Uh, where a comet comes streaking through the solar system, the Earth spins through its debris field, it introduces new elements to the world. And those elements upend the rules of biology and geology and physics and, you know, upset the geopolitical theater and create a new world within this world. And that's what I was most interested in, is a trigger event that would create new rules on a global you know, on a global basis, that it would, it would be a planetary crisis. And each of these books, the reasons it's called a cycle and not a trilogy, one, this could be six books, this could be nine books, this could be 12 books. This is infinitely generative, what I've done here. Right. And and they're not, they're not really sequels in that they all take place at the same time. And I was thinking about attrition when I did that, because a sequel always sells fewer copies. You can read these yeah. in any order. But also, I'm thinking about what am I, all the different things that I'm introducing, right? So this first book in Northern Minnesota has to do with Omnimetal. This second book has to do with alien plant life in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. The third book has to do with mirror matter and dark matter up in Alaska. And they're all speaking to each other, but they're all also individual stories. And, and yeah, that, that shared universe concept. And I think that really only works. I mean, this is what I mean by your sensitivity to what would be the human response to this. And you've got the pilferers and you've got the sufferers and then you've got the religious yeah. stuff that comes out of it. Like at, at, from every angle, how a human responds to this supernatural thing and I think that that's what really grounds the book in a, I mean, that certainly is a, again, in terms of performance, when I'm looking at how am I going to track characters, it's like all of these, the, you know, the major characters that represent each group become the archetype for the understandable human response to this event. Sure. And, you know, I've always said that it doesn't matter how awesome your vampire train is or how disgusting your squid aliens are or how amazing your pyrotechnic special effects as the, you know, giant robots fight the creatures from beneath the sea. Like, if there isn't a human heart beating at the center of it, nobody cares. So the human heart comes first. And one of the things that further compelled me to write this was studying up on over the course of several years what was happening in North Dakota. And in North Dakota you had an oil boom. The Bakken oil formation made it into a contemporary wild west. And you had people swarming there, not just from all over the country, but from all over the world. So that whole notion of the middle of nowhere becomes the center of everything, right? Yeah. There are Saudis in in northern Minnesota and Chinese and they're trying to buy up you know the mineral rights to the land there because of this precious metal that has landed and there's also prostitutes riding up in trains and roughnecks and cult members and every walk of life and one of the things I'm trying to do is humanize all of them and <clears throat> there are people in the story who are you could say villainous 
but even the good guys do terrible things, right? There's sort of like a more morally gray territory and... And even the villains do human things. There's just something, I mean, that's what I mean by it. It works on a number of different levels. Um, And I think it comes down to that sensitivity of like, you're very aware of what has come before this. You know, you're, you know what you're, the world you're kind of like leaning into. Um, But I think you're doing something that has not, I haven't seen before in terms of trying to diversify this, you know, do the cycle um, project around this. And I'm into it. (laughs) That's true from a a publishing standpoint, certainly, because I was looking at comics for inspiration in another way, in that comics come out as floppies, right? They're $2.99. Then those floppies, after five of them are released, come together as a trade paperback. Then that trade paperback later on is a collector's edition hardback with bonus material. Maybe later it's an omnibus edition too, right? And that's the way I think publishing should work. Um, it doesn't make it has, sense. It's worked very well. <laughs> like, why, why, why does publishing put out these $36 hardback? I don't know, man. I don't putting know. out the collector's edition up front. So, so instead, my whole proposal for this book was paperbacks first and and create cheap wide distribution build word of mouth later on collect them into a omnibus edition with illustrations and short stories and an essay by me and all that other stuff so that you know that thing that's super expensive people the collectors will actually seek out i don't know i that was my proposal for this whole book launch let's see <laughs> be a total failure but i wanted to try something new but and take one for the team you know you'll see if it you'll see what happens i mean i'm curious um okay this is a left field question for you but do you ever think about even if it's audio based but directing well comics are comics are an interesting medium in that they sort of boil what's happening in a film or a TV show down to just a few people. So that in a way, the the writer and the artist together are building a slow movie. Yeah. You know? And you're discussing, I'm discussing every day on the phone with some of the artists I work with, like Joshua Kassara on X-Force, you know, we're like, okay, what if we rebuild the scene in this way and we, you know, do this from really far away so that the emotion feels kind of distant. And then when that guy gets assassinated, it just seems like they're being swallowed up by nature, you know, or yeah. something like we, we talk out all of these things so that in a way we are, we are directing. I, yes, I would, I would, I mean, my biggest nerdiest desire is to have a movie shot. Um, and I was that close right before COVID hit. <laughs> Sorry, uh, supposedly, supposedly this summer, uh, James Ponsold and I, my buddy, supposedly we have a movie shooting. We'll see. But um, yes, I would love to direct, except that I'm very cranky. So I don't know that, <laughs> you know, I'm good. I'm good with people for like four hours. And then yeah, I, I don't really... think that's a problem. <laughs> that doesn't exempt a lot of other people. So <laughs> <laughs> well, I would no, just, it's just that I, just be... I, cause I, well, I think that, I, again, I think part, partially it's the, the plate spinning aspects of, you know, you're able to, you're able to keep a lot of balls in the air, but also it's the, I think back to, which if people have not read the craft book, if no one's read Thrill Me, like go get that. That was my Christmas gift to people one year. Like I just gave everybody Thrill Me and you, because you deconstruct cinema in a really valuable way as well. And I, something has occurred to me in like, even in the narration of audiobooks that people have asked me, you know, well, it's, you're an actor, like it's natural. And it's not natural because it's a weird little niche skill set. It's like the Venn diagram of, like I said, the literary stuff and then the acting stuff, but not every actor can do this. It's a, it's just a bizarre skill set. And I've started replying to people that I think what I'm actually doing is not so much acting as directing yeah. in that I'm casting, I'm casting it. I'm pacing it, I'm interpreting it, and it feels much more, that feels more like the energy. Having been an actor and been, you know, acting to a certain extent is passive on a set. 
um, you know, other people are just kind of running around doing, making it happen. And then you step in and you do your thing. And that's really not what this is. And it started making me think, obviously, how does that translate to writing? And I think that writers have that same impulse, like what you're talking about, the set dressing, the, the blocking, um, the turns in a scene, all of that is really directing Right, right. And I think that's what is happening. Yeah, I mean, every every novelist is a director. You know, yeah. directors are, are coming up to you asking, what's my motivation? And, and then you're setting obstacles in the way of them like a cruel god. And it's just, yeah, it's there's a directorial omnipotence to it all and omniscience to it all. Certainly. Yeah. Um, you know, in talking about it, jumping between roles and jumping between mediums. It also occurs to me that we you know we both are too jumping between genres and, and sort of revising them. Um, you know, I was acknowledging earlier that my influence from comics or my influence from like uh, different sci-fi films and, and sci-fi stories of the past, but I'm also trying to put my own unique stamp on that. I know that your next novel you were described, it's coming out uh, in the next year, I think. Hopefully, um, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> You described it to me as, I think, romance e, like yeah. there was like a, a hyphen and a, and a y. Um, and I'm I'm curious about, you know, you being part of the literary world, and then also, you know, tipping your hat to genre and what it's like to to straddle those territories. Yeah, um, I mean, like I said, that's kind of what like made me flee to to bread loaf in 2016 was I was working on this book that I was like not sure that's the kind of writer I wanted to be and I still had a lot of I don't know I'm gonna go ahead and say snobbery about the whole thing and I was um had come out of you know this this world this literary world and and I had I always joke but it's sort of true that when I graduated I hadn't read anything written in the last hundred years and then I started doing audiobooks and was reading things, you know, three months before they came out. And in just reading more widely and reading, getting books that I would never pick up on my own, just being, they were assigned to me, YA and romance and, you know, um, sci-fi. And I just ha suddenly had this glimpse into like, there is amazing writing in every category and in every genre. And I, it was you know, it sounds ridiculous now, but it was very eye-opening. And I kind of saw that, you know, what are the, what do I, what do I want to do? What are the stories I want to tell? And what, what it came down to is when my Oxford year came out and I was like, I don't know how, you know, the literary world just didn't, didn't care and that's fine. But I was suddenly getting those Instagram messages at 2 a.m. of people being like, this book changed my life and this was exactly what I needed at this time. And like, I've never felt this way about a book. And I was like, this was it. This was, this was what it was always about. It was about affecting people. It's the same reason I became an actor. It's the same, like, that was it. That was always what it was about. So why do I have this, you know, um, snobbery about what is essentially a marketing tool? How are books marketed? <laughs> That was it. Um, so, up, yeah. Growing up, you know, I, I was obsessed with books about vampires and dragons and robots with laser eyes and barbarians with woolly underpants. And it sounds kind of romantic to say it, I guess. But, you know, every night, just about, my parents and my sister and I were in the living room reading. I mean, some nights we were watching yeah. Star Trek The Next Generation and Kung Fu The Legend Continues, but otherwise sure. we were reading. And, and uh, you know, I'd be reading, you know, my, my dad would be reading a sci-fi novel, my mom would be reading a Western, my sister, the black sheep of the family was reading, you know, a book about physics and I would be reading Stephen King or Anne Rice or, or you know, Agatha Christie or Shirley Jackson or, or, or something of that yeah. uh, and when I first walked into a creative writing class, I was immediately told, you can't write genre. Uh, and I heard that over and over and over again. And I, I didn't know what they were. I basically put up my hand and said, but what else is there? Um, right. And I fell in love thereafter with James Baldwin and Flannery O'Connor and Leslie Soko and Annie Proulx and, you know, all of these authors I'd never heard of. 
Uh, but I never fell out of love with genre. And I guess I just eventually came to that place where I realized, you know, that as much as I value everything I've learned from literary fiction, I guess I fall, I'm sort of neither fish nor fowl. And I think you're the same way. Yeah. You, you know, you look at Margaret Atwood, you look at Kate Atkinson, you look at Susanna Clark, you look at Octavia Butler, you look at Cormac McCarthy, where do they belong in a bookstore? You know, Cormac McCarthy, the road is post-apocalyptic, child of God is horror, Sutri is literature, all the pretty And, that's, and that's where it parallels the director thing, because that's how we categorize directors. You know, a Scorsese film, well, maybe that's a bad example because they are basically all the same story. Okay, an Ang Lee film <laughs> is a completely different movie. It's everything, everything is different. That man does not do the same movie twice, but there's a sensitivity and an eye. And the eye of a director is to me parallel to the voice of an author. And that's what people sign up for. And I just, I find... I've I've kind of reached my limit and like I, that is my that is what I love I love reading those books I mean that's why I get a lot of them to record producers know this about me it's like I know some of these people are only writing for like the 10 other people that can understand how brilliant they are like I'm one of those people like give me a book that is just beautiful I love it I love it it's just not who I am as a writer and having to like acknowledge that was kind of a transitional thing for me um I'm looking at time briefly do you want to do, I have a very quick, before we go to people's questions, just like a kind of fast five gut yeah. instinct questions. Well, I'm ask, but I'm asking you the questions too. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have to pull them up. I'm worried that this is my Zoom is being weird and I will like lose you, but I think I've got it now. Okay. All right. Book that made you a reader. Book that made me a reader. I mean, the book that I have read over and over and over again is The Hobbit. Um, and I've read it with my kids and I've read it on my own and it sweeps me away every time and I delight in the language. Um, but, you know, that was the first novel I can remember reading as well. But the first thing I ever remember reading was comics. That's my formative reading experience is Spider-Man, is the X-Men, is Warlord is all you know all that good stuff so it's in my adventure stories and comic book stories and it's all just in my it's in my hard wiring yeah um what book made you a writer oh man um you know i i really as a as a kid i have to say the true confessions of charlotte doyle i always give this book so much credit but that was really the book that changed everything for me. And I was like, I want to, I want to do this, whatever this is. Um, and then to your point, I think I was reading screenplays from such a young age that a lot of those screenplays that I came into contact with that I think are just like brilliant on their own were also the first things that kind of pushed me to be like, I think I could do this. Um, yeah. I mean, I was on a show that had incredible writers. And so every week it was just like a gift of here's some beautiful writing for you to do. So, okay, the book that you reread and get something new from each time. So, the book that, I mean, I mentioned The Hobbit earlier. What, what I'll mention here is that when I was in grad school, one of the things that I did in order to perfect my sense of structure, which I felt like I was struggling with, is I began to reread authors that I felt did it really well. For example, Flannery O'Connor, great at structure in her short stories. So I would reread and reread a Flannery O'Connor story five, six times so that I was completely emotionally detached from it. And then I would be able to see all of the component parts and I would blueprint it out. For example, paragraph one, character A introduced via dialogue to reveal their central weakness. Paragraph two, theme introduced via description of setting whether it was a neighborhood or the mountains or the forest or whatever, you know, I would know that this was a story about revenge or, and, and then I would write a story based on that outline as a sort of exercise. And I did that five or six times with different stories and it just clicked your structure. So later on, after I'd written four failed novels, every novelist you'll ever meet has novels in the drawer, right? So before I published my first novel in 2010, The Wilding, prior to that, I had written four failed novels. And the thing that, changed everything for me was I did, I'm a slow learner apparently, I finally did the thing that I was doing for short stories. 
I started rereading novels. I started being a slow reader and an intentional reader. Yeah. So, you know, and alongside that, in my past life, I was a nerdy professor. I was having to teach a novel writing course at that time. And so nothing puts the fear of God in you, like having to teach a See course. See, but that is so essential. Like my favorite professor, creative writing professor at Middlebury, the, she opened her entire class by saying, look, I can't teach you how to, be, how to be a writer, but I can teach you how to read like a writer. Absolutely. And that has saved my ass so many times. And like that is, they are instructional texts. They're not meant to just be you know, put down all that's, which actually my next, oh, I guess you're asking me <laughs> next question. <laughs> the book that could make you want to give up. It's so perfect. Yeah, I, frankly, I, <laughs> I, I, yeah, the ninth medal. Um, I don't, uh, I don't know why anyone kept writing books after Middlemarch yeah. came out. Um, that's the one to me that's like, if I were, if I had been alive, then I would have just been like, oh, okay, well, the novel, that was a fun experiment. Now it's done. It's been perfected. It's over. We should all figure out something else it's to do. So good to have those moments of humility, though, where you're just yeah. glad by a book in awe. Yeah, I love I loved that. I love it. Um, okay. And book that you've read recently that is still lingering with you, reverberating, can't stop I thinking about. I recommend this book to everybody and nobody's read it. And it's amazing. It's called The First 15 Lives of Harry August, and it's by Claire North. She's a Brit. Um, and it's, at first glance, a concept you might recognize. It's uh, Groundhog Day asking that Harry August wakes up at birth over and over again. His mother is giving birth to him on a train platform. She dies. Uh, and he goes to live at this manor. And, and anyways, every life begins that way. But he accumulates lives, right? And so he remembers everything. And, and over time, what happens is he recognizes that there are others like him. I don't just mean in this time period. I mean all of time. And they start to communicate with one another and call each other the Cronus Club. And so imagine that there's a 95-year-old man on his deathbed. And a four-year-old girl walks in to the hospital and you know comes up to him and whispers something in his ear that four-year-old girl might actually be 700 years old because she's lived over and over and over right. again he lives to be 95 as well so she knows what happens 95 in the 95 years in the future she whispers it in his ear so when he dies ne the next day he's able to communicate that future to the past right and so on if you imagine that ripple effect and what they come to understand is that the earth the world is ending sooner and sooner. And one of their, their members, one of the members of the Cronus Club might be responsible. Anyway, it's oh. amazing. It's so oh good. Oh my God. Okay. Okay, that's amazing. All right, great. That's, uh, that, uh, that was good. Okay. All right, guys. Um, let's see here. Um, okay. Got a couple of questions. So I'm curious, this is for me, when you're alone in your studio recording a book, do you use your hand motions as part of your process? So I can up to a point, but I can't make noise. So I've learned how to like kind of button it all up, but it is, that's, that was the biggest adjustment from like on camera acting is that I can't really use my face or my body. <laughs> so that's I've had to learn how to do that. That, um, that audio book though, that the same thing happened to me and that they'd be like, your belt's clinking. Your shirt is noisy. I can hear your <laughs> stomach rumbling. Stop making that popping sound with your lips. The stomach rumble is like basically how I spend 90% of my day is trying to like appease the beast that lives inside me. Otherwise, <laughs> I, I can't do my job. I'm either hungry or I'm digesting. It's always rumbling. So if you listen to the Red Moon audiobook, it's appropriate maybe because it sounds like there's an <laughs> Well, in, in the background. <laughs> it's sound design. It's sound design. Um, question from Laura for me. How many hours a day do you narrate? How do you handle when your voice fails you? So my voice hasn't failed me in a while um, because I don't push it anymore. Uh, when I was doing like 70 or 80 books a year, I ended up having to take a month off to do vocal rest and I'm never doing it again. Uh, so I try to limit it to two finished hours a day, which means four to five hours actually in the booth. Um, and it means I do fewer books, but it's necessary for vocal health for me. Um, Laura, I'm like this in five years. Yeah. 
we're gonna get to i mean honestly though over the course of my career though my voice has gotten lower like it is a very different voice than i started with because it's just there's a lot of miles on this voice now um yeah (laughs) uh laura wants to know so many audiobooks are sold because of the narrator why don't you all get residuals oh that's a very good question (laughs) uh you know the industry. I, I don't know. And at this point, I'm worried that we're all going to be replaced by robots before we can ever get this fixed. But it is a, it's just, it's, it's wrong. But, you know, uh, that's publishing, I guess. Um, a number of people are going to check out the audiobook for Ninth Metal because you narrated it. And yeah, well, I mean, yeah, it's a, you know, it's, it's a weird industry thing where like we're at the, this nexus of like publishing and acting, which are all royalty and residual based mailbox money systems, but it's not part of the, uh, the, the project. Um, but that means when I do a book, I genuinely love it. And when I promote it, I genuinely love it because, you know, um, Okay, Andrew would like to know, what made you move, this is for you, to Minnesota from the Pacific Northwest? Has it changed your writing? So I grew up in Oregon and Hawaii and and bounced all around, even within those two states. Um, And and my life has been pretty peripatetic ever since then. I mean, I have lived in Rhode Island and uh, Illinois and Wisconsin and Iowa uh, you know, my, my wife and I have also lived briefly in Ireland and um, in France and, you know, j- jumping all around has just sort of been the design of my life. And, and we made the, you know, concerted decision to like, we wanted to raise our kids in one place. Um, we wanted to give them a sense of heritage, rootedness. So uh, we chose Northfield, Minnesota. It's about an hour and a half away from my wife's family farm uh, outside of Eau Claire. And uh, it's just a great community. We looked at sort of a three hour window around the farm and looked at Duluth and Madison and the Twin Cities and all these cool places, but decided on this. And, and it's, yeah, I mean, Minnesota is beautiful. It has a lot of green space, a lot of wild places in it, including the Boundary Waters and the Arrowhead, which is the section uh, of one of my favorite sections of the country. And it's certainly my favorite section of the state. And that's the, the stage for the ninth medal as well. Um, we have Lake Superior. We have an incredible art scene. Uh, the progressive politics of Minnesota appeal to me. So all of these yeah. things, you know, have made it home. And uh, I guess living in the Midwest for almost a decade, more than a decade now, I've lived in Minnesota for almost a decade. Yeah, it's certainly changed me. Minnesota, I may be totally wrong about this, but Minnesota actually like strikes me as the Oregon of the Midwest. It has a lot in common. We're missing the Cascades, but otherwise, okay. Yeah, I, I feel uh, like. And, and Julia too is from Oregon, from Salem. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, but yeah, that's a. So has it changed your writing? Is the second part to this question? Uh, I mean, there's a lot more. There's a lot more winter in my life. <laughs> in my life. Um, yeah, you know, it took me. I should say this. It took me ten years before I felt as though I could set a novel in Minnesota. Everything else mm-hmm. is set. In- Northwest. And that's because I feel like it's not just the geography that you have to become familiar with. It's the history of a place. It's the politics of a place. It's the, the culture of a place. It's the vernacular of a place and the, and the myths. And so I sort of had to just live here that well, was orbit all to represent it adequately. Yeah, well, that was something that I loved about, um, was it Deadlands? Was that your Lewis and Clark? Yeah, that was Yep. Yeah. And I mean, that was just like for, again, the, from the Oregon perspective, I was like, you take, I mean, that is mythology. That is like, you know, right. a foundational yeah. myth of that you state. Up in Oregon, you know, you go to Fort Clatsop at least five times. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and you're stopping, you know, on your vacations throughout the state, you're probably stopping along the Oregon Trail and at Lewis and Clark, you know, history sites and receiving yeah. like from your parents. So that stuff's just ingrained in you. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Um, and we also have a recommendation from Janice saying, if you liked Harry August, read Replay by Ken Grimwood. Okay. All right. I will do that. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, any other questions before we do you want to scroll through chat? Make sure we didn't miss anything in the... Um, uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, you do need this book, Laura. After the reading, yes, you need this book. Um, Oh. Thanks, 
ready for hanging out. Oh yeah, this was this was really and yes, and Thrill Me is fantastic. Uh, so is Deadlands, and then this is just I really um, thoroughly enjoyed this, and not just because I was paid not in royalties to say this. <laughs> I have no investment in it beyond this point. I just really, really love this and I cannot wait to read the next one. Thank you. Thanks for bringing it to life and making me sound better than I am. Uh, I doubt that's true. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's true. Like I said, I want to hear you read it. I'd love to hear you do Stacy's voice. <laughs> Work on that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sort of feeling like I would love it if you, you could just keep doing story time. Just read the whole book. <laughs> the two of you, you have together a way to do that. <laughs> well, hey, wait, there it is. <laughs> there it is. That Libro, that nice Libro FM link. Everybody, yeah, go check, check out. it out. Go check it out. Libro is the best, the absolute best. So great. Yeah. I feel like, let me just do a little pitch for Libro right now for the people that are still on this. Like, if you have been worried, you know, where is my Amazon money going to? With Libro, it's the same price, I believe, as Audible, and you can, you get one credit a month, plus I think it's 30% off, like, their catalog whenever you want it, and you get to designate which bookstore your money benefits. So it's for indie bookstores to actually have audiobooks be a part of their um, stock, and it's great. Everything that she just said <laughs> is 100% true. I cannot support Libro FM enough. They're they're so wonderful. So thank you both so much for being here. I'm so kind of sad to to shut down the conversation. This has been such a great talk. Um, everyone in chat, thank you so much for being here, for asking good questions and having so much fun in this chat box. It was great to see what you all had to say. Um, as always, go go track down those books. Come on in. Come grab a copy or follow that link to Libro. Uh, tweet us, let you know, let us know what you thought of this event. And I think that this is where I say one more huge thank you to both of our authors. And we start our awkward goodbye waving. <laughs> 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 Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.